Thank you very much for inviting me back. It's a real privilege to be here um, for this particular Poets and Players um, in memory, really, of, of Linda, who I didn't really meet properly in person. Um, but she was kind enough during our emailing um, to say that she, she liked a particular poem of mine um, from Oldborough. So um, I'd like to, to start by reading that poem um, for Linda and, um, and for everyone who knew and loved her. Um, interestingly, it's a poem about somebody who's um, very full of life and very huge of spirit. And it sounds like maybe Linda was one of those people. It's about a man whose left hand thought it was a chicken, <clears throat> called the man whose left hand thought it was a chicken. The man whose left hand thought it was a chicken did some things remarkably well, like catching flies and finding dropped earrings or contact lenses. Others, making omelette, say, he learned to perform with his left hand deep in a pocketful of seed. Mere incidentals if your arm does chicken from the elbow down. At times, for sure, sheer cock up well before he was, especially if his woman was in town. Cock hand was known to arc at strangers in the pub or jump soft objects. Shopping for fruit with cock hand was no joke. But there was hen hand too, heat-seeking, full of mild compulsions. This bird knew a thing or two about the secret berries of his lover's flesh, the dust bowl of her back, and rumbled the acorn growing at her breast and fluttered at her cheekbones till she slept. Then, for the kids alone, the crazy bantam hand of knock-knocks, now you see it. Still, to say the sun's play through his fingers made the brightest comb, to say he crossed the road more often than required, to say he only ever drove an automatic, never got promoted, and was photographed more often than he liked, to say he almost had his own eye out a hundred times, is not to say the man was not his own man. No. He was a flock of tangents and surprises. And without him, we have lost all memory, all possibility of flight. Bad karaoke. The wedding night of my second trip to Scotland Two by two of us propping up the bar of the Kilmarnock Travel Lodge in something less comfortable, which happens to be karaoke night in these heels. All day shy as a tree frog in my patterned dress, and now the whole room glitters. Even my true love says, ah, shouldn't it feel I have to? as I launch my high notes at the tone-deaf anaglypta. If the makeup runs, it's just I haven't slept since Thursday, and I've lived on crisps for three days. Only dinner make me drive home on a hangover's slipped gears, the sun on my forehead past Dumfries, still asking why indeed. Delilah. <laughs> um, this is a, a poem I wrote for a, a, a friend. It's actually about traffic jams, which really are kind of a genre of their own, really. Um, but I, I wrote this actually for a, a friend, um, a memorial service I was late for. God, of all the things to be late for. Um, it's called Nine Miles Stationery. 
Nine miles stationary, we stretch from our vehicles like mollusks, raw flesh bared to a flaring sky. Fair play, I never figured Swindon for the promised land. A girl grits her heels on the hard shoulder, sporting an inexplicable ball gown at high noon. She spits into her mobile's cutthroat blade. I fucking said, I fucking don't know. And my father, loving nothing, like emergency, is on the phone too. Should have checked first, should have... Though my life has not once yet proved urgent. Some kid on the inside lane can't wait. His mother strips him business-like and points his little penis at the verge. Even from here, his face a clap of rage. Meanwhile, the queue grows rearwards like a German sentence back to Bristol, where I stopped to squeeze into my dark dress. Lizzie, take it as the crow flies. I may have to bury you out here, though being on time would still have been too late. Lilies, exhausted on the passenger seat, their scent given up on a wreath of my own heat. Someone else's water. Um, the new collection is um, partly, um, well, there's a sequence in it called Catullus, um, which draws on, on Catullus, the first century BC Roman poet, very loosely. Um, Catullus, of course, is known chiefly for his, his unrequited love poems and, <coughs> excuse me, and um, his bawdy, his filth, really. And um, I suppose what I've tried to do in this very, very loosely based sequence is, um, is bring those two things together. And um, also to sort of to, to, to bring Catullus back. I mean, not enough people read him. Um, and my version is very, very, um, very irreverent, I suppose, towards him. Um, all you need to know, really, are that uh, my chief character, the Catullus figure, is, is a woman called Catulla. And, and she lives in somewhere a little bit like Aberystwyth. Um, not literally, of course, but yeah. So I'd like to read a couple of these for, and, and then something else. Um, and this is the one where this character introduces herself and she's basically um, addressing her unrequited lover who's called Rufus. Catulla. Well, Rufus, here's a talent for the inappropriate to make the tawdriest suburban dogger blush. And after all these months, as single as a bar stool. It's not enough that you look less at me than at a passing bicycle, but still I make a case for you. How suddenly you so surpass the local streaks of piss, my friends ring all the haddock handed lads and hit the pubs without me. I must hear how you leave women fired like bows in hotel rooms across the city. Yet, despite myself, I keep my health. I will grow old. A clever woman wouldn't die of feelings merely. Love, I wish you were ridiculous. Best you never meet my friends who in their cups would tell you how I starved for weeks and wandered through the streets in borrowed dresses, bless, a flame for an encounter. Dear God, may you never know how slow, unlovely women burn, nor how we keep our heads down. Sod you. All the books say I must break this at the stem, live long, die happy. Take these petals as they come for kisses, curses, kisses. 
I've noticed that the, the older I get, the more at the weekend that the whole world seems to be taken over by very confident, beautiful young people. Um, this is particularly true in Aberystwyth. Actually, it was true when I arrived here. I think there's some concert or something going on, and there were just hordes of these gorgeous young people just pushing us into the gutter. That's how it is. Um, and this is another Catullus poem. There are a lot of um, letter poems to friends in Catullus, and, and this is one. Um, and it's one about, about this, this, uh, this phenomenon, which is wonderful, actually, because it's kind of beauf beautiful and confident, um, but it makes one feel really old and haggard. Um, and um, there is reference here to, to the Rufus character again, who, who, in the sequence, it becomes clear, is just a bit ridiculous and a bit tawdry, really. Dear Kate, weekend pavements are for pale girls. All the milk-fed daughters of our town are out, their neon eyelids flashing. They are scaring cats and setting off alarms, are brazen with their cigarettes and tampons, passing lip gloss round with strips of teeny pills, absurdly fluent in their kissing, always kissing, oh, someone, and Rufus, strolling on the promenade, says, Hello, Kirsty. Jess, you're looking stunning. Sam, I almost didn't. When did you become so? What a cult of shrieks. But later, when they clatter past in tears, or carry injured seagulls home in chip cartons, or share a fag end on the prom, I cannot stop to think of them at our age, thickening in the cul-de-sacs of clapped-out marriages, worse, desiccating over spreadsheets. Which side are we on now, Kate? P.S. Coffee? Soon? This is a, a moon poem after um, Catullus' Hymn to Diana. And I'm, it's meant to be a kind of song, and I'm, I'm teaching myself to play the ukulele, because I want nothing more than to come up and go ding, 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 and do it properly. But I can't today, I'm afraid, so I just have to pretend. Another moon song, Rufus. Two, three, four, anyway, loves nothing like the moon. The moon's a drag, a passive aggressive in a better woman's dress. The one you find outside your house at 3 a.m. in tears, wanting to talk things through. The moon has issues. She won't lighten up that Botoxed princess who, in private, loves to play the psycho at the high school dance. How casually she shakes the blood from her corsage and limps home barefoot, smoking. Then she hacks her mama into bits, and all day long the girl's been starving, or a binging, or she's scratching at her face. And she'll outlive us all, the chilly bitch. She'll outlive all of us, and one. This is an Aberystwyth poem, really. Um, the Catullus original is based on a, a, a bridge in Verona, and basically he wishes that one of his enemies in love would fall headfirst off the bridge into a pile of crap. Um, in Aberystwyth, we have a, a pier, just about. <laughs> the main attraction. That is the pier, esprit de l'escalier held up with spray and starling shit. All night, it rocks with dancing. Furious treads the tinder of the old boards, swearing blind he sees the lights of Dublin, he's that tight. Someone's wife stacked up against him like a pinball machine, and the one he came with, smoking at the railing as the sea lays tactful napery between the groins. She's humming, New York, New York, want to, thinking how the mud would clam the eyelids shut and tense its wriggly fingers. All the little mouths would suck like dead stars. 
It's a bridge with cold feet. Wake up, someone's bawling as she steps back onto mapped land in the city that never. The last of these I'd like to read is um, a wedding hymn, or in Catullus it is, and it summons Hymen, the god of love and weddings, I think, down to the, to the wedding. And it, it kind of reads like, um, I don't know, like a panning shot across the city. Um, so that's kind of what mine is. And I've repeated that phrase, um, summoning Hymen. In the original Catullus Codex, there is a missing verse, and um, it's either been, I don't know, corrupted or, or maybe censored. It might well be censored, actually, because it's about, well, you'll see, because what I've done is just left that bit blank. <laughs> so um, I guess I'm just going to be silent for a couple of lines when I get to that. But it struck me that it was so perfect, the fact that that bit wasn't present, that I left it as it was. Hymen Hymenius. All for the sun, which was the first sex, coaxing into motion every protein, every mineral, each cell, Hymenius, Hymen, Io, Io, Hymen, Hymenius. So to the cooling of salt at the temples and the pale foot bruising the grass, to office workers' bare arms, spreading picnics in the lunch hour, all the loosened ties of Keppel Street and builders whistling, don't pretend you don't know, girls, it's old rules when the trees release their pheromone. One for the boy, awkward with books and violin case. Oh, that bobtail of white knicker in the sports hall, how it flickers just behind his closed eyes. One for the bag lady pushing her trolley of cats down a dangerous pavement to pick the municipal hyacinths, three, four, five, yes, each of her darlings. One for the auspices of starlings, the jogger who stops as a hearse rolls past to tilt his dripping forehead, his breath held close like a torch. And here is the wedding whose bride steps out dazzled, whose groom steps out dazzled, down to the sea through the petals. Hymenius, Hymen, Io, Io, Hymen, Hymenius. One for the queenly ovum in her hive of cells, for the ticklish seed and fosterers and donors, and the white-coated harvester pacing her glittering clinic. O bed in which all and at the white foot of the bed. All for the night feed and depth watch, for the budded hand and teaspoonfuls of breath, the moon in its sling turning slowly. Hymenius, Hymen, Io. Io, Hymen, Hymenius. And I'll finish with um, a poem that's, um, excuse me, a kind of gospel, when, when I was at, well I, I moved schools, um, doesn't matter when, but basically I moved from a very conventional uh, Catholic upbringing to a, a, a much more, at the time, right on, trendy one, and it involved the Good News Bible, um, which I don't know if people are still familiar with, but it was a real shock to me, um, because it tried to be very kind of trendy, and, and I still find it quite interesting the way it retains some elements of that kind of lovely kind of King Jamesian cadence, but it kind of bumps up really uncomfortably against sort of phrases like, righty-ho, said Jesus, or, you know, let's go, chaps, or something like that, and it, it, it's kind of charming, but it also seems kind of wrong. Um, this is a poem that's sort of somehow uh, drew on, on that, and it's, I suppose it's a kind of contemporary gospel set somewhere a little bit like Everest with. It's called According To. Once, about the time you start to notice trees, and he found out his wife was not his wife in any sense but name, Elijah took the dog, two apples from the sideboard, and went out. Not long afterwards, he came upon an old friend bent beneath the bonnet of his car, cursing every sprocket of combustion engines. 
What do you suppose the point is? Asked Elijah. And the friend replied, I have to be there. Throw your spanners down and come with me, Elijah said. And so the friend did. And his name was Thomas, after whom he never thought to ask. And Elijah was amazed. Next, there was a daughter which, close up, they didn't know. But Thomas said she looked a lot like his girl would have had she lived. He split one apple three ways and the girl laughed and her laugh was as a pocketful of loose change as the moment when you down your pint and dance. Her name was Manon. She was heading to the clinic. Then she got her mobile phone out. Ma'am, she said. So from there they went north telling stories till they came upon a farmer bitter drunk for all his fields had failed. They listened, picking fruit seeds from their teeth and where those fell sprang cider presses, booming. Soon a crowd came out to see what had been happening. I killed a man, said one man, looking thin. Shit happens, said Elijah. Sell your house, give all the money to his folks and walk with us. The man did. He gave nobody his name. Meanwhile, the crowds grew till there wasn't room to slide a slice of toast between them. Thomas asked, what's this about then? And Elijah said, just as you left your hurtful car to walk with me, so this lot feel. Look at the rhododendrons. They don't give a toss about the funding cuts, the polar bears. They do their own thing. Throw your keys into that hedge. Ignore the cameras. Be your own true kicking self. So Thomas did. He was a simple man and able to draw truth like tears from anyone. Elijah said, You know the way that pressure regulating valves secure the rear brake lines for heavy braking? Thomas nodded. Well, Elijah said, you see, that's you. At this, the grief beat out like crows, and Thomas felt a hatching in the space of light. Elijah felt it too, and where they left a third unheard of apple grew a hamlet, grew a village, grew a town where people started over hopefuler than all the born-again virgins of America. These are the words of Manon, set down with the baby on her knee. Elijah Thomas, he'll be. All this happened. Thank you.